Yeah. Um, Gail is so, our keynote speaker for Sign, uh, Scientific Python and or on the PyData track today. Uh, I, th I think the most of you know Gail already. Uh, he's uh, uh, one of he's, he's like the core member, or like one like. One of the main uh, contributors to the, the scientific stack, um, and uh, yeah, please welcome Gail. It's working? Not yet. No worries. Okay. Am I on? Good. So screen is working. Mic is working. Slides are working. Cool. Okay. So thank you, everybody, for coming here. Thanks a lot uh, to the organizers and to Alex uh, for the, the introduction. So I think we'll agree that your Python is pretty cool, right? Yeah, 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 right. So the, Cy the CIDR uh, event was really cool yesterday. So I hope you all got coffee this morning. I did? OK, so what I'd, I'd like to do in this talk is to address a bit the very diverse community that we have here. And so what, what this talk tries to be is a reflection on what we have in common, which is Python. So I'll be talking about things you don't understand, which is my science, and things that I don't understand, which is web development. So I don't know how I get into these horrible situations. Anyhow, I did at some point a PhD in quantum physics, so I think I qualify as a scientist. But these days, I do computer science for a neuroscience. So what we try to do is that we try to link uh, neural activity, so firing of the neurons, basically, to thoughts and cognition, like what you would do when you drive a car. The way we do this is we use brain imaging. And specifically, we, uh, we pitch this as a machine learning problem. This is what I do. And we've developed Python software to do this, of course. So if you want to try this, you can actually do prediction of things like visual stimuli based on recordings of brain activity using this open source software and open data. You can go online, it's there. But I won't be talking about this today. So on the way, we created a machine learning library, which is known as uh, scikit-learn. So I say we because it was many people. It was, of course, not only me or my lab. And so it was a huge success we suddenly became cool. Because data science, as you might have noticed, is a fairly cool thing these days. So these days, Python is the go-to language for data science. So I'd like to think a bit about how did that happen? Because we did build scikit-learn, and other built pandas, and other tools. But these were built on a solid foundation, and Python is really giving us that foundation. So to set a bit the picture, scientists do have a reputation of being a bit different in the Python community, at least historically. You may say that they come from Jupiter. But then, to us, web developers are very different. And uh, actually, most scientists do not know what a DevOps is. I, I, I saw these kind of discussions. What do you do? I'm a DevOps. What does that mean? OK, so we're different. For instance, web developers worry about strings. Well, we worry about numbers, in arrays, of course. Web developers care about databases. Well, uh, we think in terms of arrays, of, of numbers, of course. Uh, so you might think of object-oriented programming. Ah, no, arrays are good enough. Flow control, uh, we can actually do with arrays, right? All right, so there's a bit of a culture gap, right? All right, so let's, let's do something together. Uh, how about we sort the EuroPython Website. I mean, there are too many abstracts, 205. I can't read them all. And they're, you know, they're hugely varied. You know, they go from OpenStack to making $10 million with a startup. So let's find something using data science. And so the way we'll do this is that we'll do a bit of web scrapping to get the data from the website. I could have asked the, the conference organizers, but that was boring, right? And then we'll do a bit of text analysis, and then we'll do data science, and we'll give you topics. So the nice thing about this example is it walks us through a good part of the whole uh, 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 Python stack. That's why I like it. Uh, so we're going to be using things like URL lib or beautiful soup, but also uh, scikit-learn and matplotlib or word cloud for plotting. 
So the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to crawl the website. And so our goal here is to get a schedule. So from the schedule, I mean to retrieve the list of titles and URL. And then we're going to just crawl the pages and retrieve abstracts. And we've, I've been doing this using Beautiful Soup. If you've never used it, it's an awesome library that allows you to basically do some matching on the, the document object model tree of an HTML page. So it's really awesome. The scientists would never have developed that. Then we're going to vectorize the text. The idea is that if you get a text, it's a bunch of words, right, or characters. So for each document, we're going to count how many times a word appears, and we're going to put this in a table. So we're going to call this the frequency, frequency for each term. So here we have a term frequency uh, vector that's describing my, my, my document. Uh, and you can see that the most common word is A, and then the Python is very common. So maybe that's not a very good description, because some of these terms are all over the documents. So what we can do is that we can do the ratio between the terms all over the documents, the, the frequency of the terms over the whole database, and the frequency of the term in the document. So we call this the um, um, TF-IDF, so term frequency inverse document frequency. And you can do this with scikit-learn using what, what's called the TF-IDF vectorizer. OK, so now I feel a bit more in my comfort zone. I've gone from text, which I don't understand, to vectors of numbers. Oof, feels better. So we, if we look at all the documents, then we have a matrix, right? A 2D array that gives us the uh, terms in the document. So it's the term document matrix. This could be represented as a sparse matrix, because most of the terms are present in very few documents, right? So we can use the SciPy stack to use sparse matrices. And the good news is that the scientific community, not even the scientific Python community, has developed lots of fast operations for uh, sparse matrices. So we're doing text mining with things that have been developed by people who do partial differential equations or things like this. Cool. Then we want to extract topics. So what we're going to do here is that we're going to do matrix factorization. We're going to take this a term document matrix, and we're going to factorize it into two matrices, one that gives the loadings of uh, documents on various terms, and the other that gives the loadings of, no, sorry, loadings of documents on what we are going to call topics, and then loadings and topics on terms, right? So here, the first matrix tells me what documents are in a different topic. And the second matrix tells me what terms are in a different topic. So this is a matrix factorization algorithm. So once again, I'm back into things I know as a computer scientist. Often we do this with non-negative constraints in um, text mining, because the fact that a term is negatively loaded on a topic might or might not mean something. You can do this in scikit-learn, scikit-learn.decomposition.nmf for non-negative matrix factorization. That's where the magic happens. So we run this, and we get word clouds. So that's the representation of the first topic. And what is it about? It's about the Python language. Good news. The second topic is about, well, science and machine learning. And then the third topic is something like testing. And then we can look at all the topics, and there's a bunch of different things. You may have asynchronous, you've got a topic about the community, one about basically conference organization, internet of thing, best practice, and one I'm, I'm not showing here, which is talks in Spanish. <laughs> or Basque. <laughs> OK. So as Python is not only a numerical language, we can also output a website from this using a templating engine. And if you work a bit, I think you can get a reasonably use, usable website. So uh, it's on the web. You can have a look at it. And there's a link to the code that actually generates all this, so you can run it if you're interested. So you want to try it. OK, pip install scikit-learn. Ah, no. It complains that NumPy is not installed. All right, pip install NumPy. Bang. It wants a C compiler. Now you're starting to get angry at me, right? 
So it's back to the fact that we're different. Historically, we've had a lot of problems with, well, people don't have fortune compilers. Why don't you guys have fortune compilers? Why are you laughing? Fortune is giving us really, really fast libraries. I mean, between a naive C implementation of matrix operations and a fortune optimized one, you can get the factor of 70 of difference. The factor of 70 is something, right? So packaging has been historically a major roadblock for uh, scientific Python. And the reason is we really rely on a lot of compiled code and shared libraries. So we've been hitting problems like the fact that libraries were not there or ABI um, uh, compatibility issues. Now, the good news is that there is a huge amount of progress for two reasons. The first one are wheels, and specifically recently many uh, Linux wheels. So the idea being that you rely only on a conservative core set of uh, libraries. So that basically is solving. So that the problem I showed shouldn't happen anymore. It should, should work. You can try it. Tell me if it doesn't work. And the other, other reason is that there's this thing that's called OpenBLAST, which is linear algebra uh, not using Fortran. So that's good news. By the way, Fortran is a very modern language that is super performant because it allows you automatic vectorization, which C cannot do because it's got different semantics. So don't think that Fortran is something from the 70s. Well, it is, but... Okay, so we're different. But if we work together, we can get really awesome things. So for instance, I hope that you can get this example to get text mining in any of your websites. It should be easy to do, right? Really. So it's magic, but you can use it. All right. So now let me, let me help you think a bit more like a, like a scientist and, and how we code. And you know what? It's mostly about numerics. So we really love NumPy. You know NumPy, right? It's the numerical Python library. It's matrix op operations. Arrays operation. So the reason we really love NumPy is because it's fast. So let's try, for instance, to compute the product of term frequencies versus inverse document frequencies on 100,000 terms, right? So we can do this with list comprehension, and it takes six milliseconds. Now, six milliseconds may not sound a lot, but when I do, say, non-negative matrix factorization algorithm, I do these things many, many, many times. And actually, 100,000 terms is not big data, it's tiny data. So that is actually a toy example. Now if we do this with NumPy, so the code is slightly different, and we get 70 microseconds. So that's almost a factor of 1,000 speed up. Another thing that we really like is that if you're used to it, that it's actually very much more readable. Array computing requires learning it, but once you've learned it, it's extremely readable, right? Compare the uh, TF times IDF to compute TF times IDF to the list comprehension. So it's important to realize that arrays are actually, to us, nothing but pointers. What, it, what defines a NumPy array is a memory address, a data type, a shape, and a stride. So the shape and the stride are things that tell you how you can move through the array, and basically you're moving through the array by pointer arithmetics, okay? You're just moving from one, one point to another by computing offsets. So what an array represents is regular data in a structured way. So this is really important because it matches the memory model of just about every numerical library, whether it's in C, C++, Fortran, or actually, I believe, other languages, most languages. So it allows us, us copyless interactions across this compiled language border. So for me, the value of NumPy is really that it's a memory model. So let's look a bit at why it's fast. So if you're computing TF times IDF, one thing is that you're not getting any type checking during the operation, you're first you're getting all the, the, the dynamic type uh, uh, during the computation to, do, to know what TF times IDF will do. But then it's compiled code that runs the, the operation. But then maybe most importantly, you're using direct regular sequential memory access. Okay? 
So you're just grabbing your data. There's no pointer D referencing. Well, there's one, but after you're done. You're just grabbing chunks of data from, from the RAM or from the cache, and that's really fast. And so then your CPU or your math kernel library can implement things like vector operations using, for instance, SIMD uh, operations. So that's what really, really makes NumPy fast. The type checking is part of it, but it's not only it. All right. So it's much faster than this. It's cool. Now let's look at this. Once the array gets big enough, then suddenly we get a factor of two cost in compute time per element. So do you have an idea what this may be due to? Excellent. It's cache. So 10 to the 5 elements, that's approximately the size of a CPU cache. You could do the computation. You know, these are probably float 64, so they're 8 bytes. Right. So the problem is that memory is much slower than the CPU. So your goal when you want fast calculation is to get things in the CPU as fast as possible. And here, you're starting to get out of the cache. So that's bad news for, for array computing. But there's even worse. If we do a slightly more complex operation, so TF times IDF minus 1, then the cost actually starts increasing. So what's going on here? Well, if we look at what's happening, Python is computing TF times IDF and creating an array that we don't see. I'm, uh, I'm going to call it temporary array. And then it's removing one from this temporary array. So what we're doing here is that we're really moving things in and out the cache hugely. So we get pretty bad cache invalidation here. So, and, and this is because of the Python computing model. It's just the way Python works. So we can time this, and we see that there is a huge cost to removing this one in terms of computation. OK, we can play a trick, is that we can unroll this and do things slightly better by using an in-place operation for the second one. So the idea is that we're reusing the allocation of the temporary array. We're not allocating arrays twice. If we do this, it gets much, much faster. And the reason is we've become much better with cache. We invalidate less cache. So if we look at our graph, we can do a NumPy in place. So it's still going up with, with the number of elements. But because of this in place operation, it's um, faster. So what we have here is really a compilation problem. right? We want to go from this expression to this expression. Uh, so we want to do things like removing or reusing temporaries, or we might want to actually chunk operations. right? So if I could do a for loops that does loops on the data size of the right size, then it would be fast. And so for instance, NumExp, uh, which is something that's mostly developed by uh, Francesc Alted, can do this using string expressions. So that's, that's an example. Num NumExp evaluate tf times idf minus 1. And without being clever, NumExp was clever for us, you get the speed up. Okay? So you get the same speed up as uh, NumPy in place. All right? So have you heard of Numba? So Numba is basically a, a, a just-in-time compiler, well, a compiler that does these kinds of things uh, with bytecode in, um, uh, inspection. Another approach is a nice package that's called Lazy Array that basically builds an expression but doesn't evaluate it and then evaluate it when you call it. Okay? So basically, it's going around the uh, a Python evaluation model. And I'd like to point that this is actually not a problem that is specific to scientific computing. Uh, it's a similar problem to things like grouping and paginating uh, SQL queries. Now, I'm talking about things I don't know here, right? So just to, to, to summarize the kind of things you could give to your, your CTO or your CEO, if it's too small, you get overhead. Overhead of Python, overhead of creation of arrays. If it's too big, you fall out of cache. So your optimum lies in the middle. We probably want to be lying here because that's where big data is. That's where the magic is, the money is. I see people taking pictures, so I... <laughs> this part, right? Uh, OK. What if we need flow control? For instance, we don't want to divide by IDF when it's 0. 
So I told you we don't use flow control. So what we're going to do is that we're going to do an expression that's a test expression. It's basically saying that where IDF is zero, that returns an array of booleans, then I will put TF IDF to zero. Okay? So that way we don't need flow control. Cool. So um, suppose we're looking at ages in a population, and I want to compute the mean age of males versus females. So then I can uh, uh, select the age array with a gender array and say, well, where gender is equal to male, uh, I'll compute the mean and I'll subtract where gender is equal to gender. That's a typo. Uh, now, this is really look, starting to look like a database, right? We're really trying to, starting to do selections. So um, on, top of, on top of NumPy, in parallel to NumPy, there's a library called Pandas that is really something in between arrays and in an in-memory database. So it's, it's been huge, hugely by the PyData community because it's fantastic for these queries and this data messaging. Uh, for numerical algorithms, it's maybe less fantastic because uh, anyhow, we're going to be falling back to NumPy. Okay. So what you guys are going to tell me is you're not really doing Python, right? You're doing a bit of beautiful Python code that sits on top of lots of ugly Fortran and C++ routines. And that gives you scalability, but it's installation problems. But then I realized that most web development is actually some beautiful Python code that's sitting on services like a database that could be in C++, in Java, in Erlang, in God knows what, in Node.js. And that actually gives us deployment problems. So you don't have compilation problems, you have deployment problems. So we're not that different, right? We're just struggling with similar things instantiated in a different uh, manner. So um, uh, these days, I like to think as NumPy as the scientist equivalent to an ORM. And I don't use ORMs, so I don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, numerics, as we've seen, are really efficient because we apply them to regular space data. But NumPy, the way it works, creates cache misses for big arrays. So we need to fight to remove temporaries and maybe chunk data. Uh, if we do queries, then they're going to be really efficient uh, if uh, we can use indexes or trees. So typically, databases do that. But we're going to need uh, to uh, group queries. So all these are compilation problems. But compilations is unpythonic. So we can do, for instance, we could think of a computation and query language. That's a bit what NumExpert does. But I really hate the main specific languages. And each time I try to use SQL, because I'm not a web developer, I get it wrong and I get annoyed. And the other problem is that NumPy is actually extremely expressive. The amount of things that you can do with NumPy or with related tools is extremely varied. Uh, so I don't think that's a good way to go. And anyhow, I like Python. I want to be doing Python. So one approach is to hack Python. And a really cool example is PonyRM. Who knows PonyRM? It's web development. You should be better than me at that. So what PonyRM does uh, is it will uh, compile Python generators to optimize SQL queries. So you're going to write something that looks like a, a Python generator, but it's going to do bytecode inspection. Well, AST inspection, I believe, uh, and, and then grab, grab the AST and build a, a SQL query on top of this and optimize it uh, via compilation and grouping. So, so that, that's really cool. It's no longer really pure Python, but it's really cool. Uh, so I'd like to, to draw your attention to something that is happening a lot in the big data, the big data uh, world which is something that's known as uh, a Spark. And it's, it's a rising star, and it's in, in Scala, so basically on top of the JVM, on top of the, the Java world. And it combines two things. It combines a distributed store. So people don't realize this usually, but it combines a distributed store, which is some form of database-like uh, a store and a computing model, and it plugs them together, and it allows it to do distributed computing in a reasonably efficient way. Now, the thing is that we, so PyData World, are actually much faster when the data fits in RAM. 
And the reason is that uh, we're really representing data as regular space arrays, and so then we're going extremely fast. Whereas the Java world has a lot of pointer dereferences. Okay? So, if we want to scale up, maybe we're going to have to do operations in chunks, right? Maybe we need to chunk the data, and then maybe in parallel or in series, doesn't really matter, compute things on arrays that say fit in RAM or fit in cache. Now, this is great for certain computing patterns, things that, for instance, are known as extract, transform, and load. Uh, but if you're doing multivariate statistics, which machine learning is about, uh, you're really combining information from all over the arrays. You're really, you know, you're really learning to, uh, that, that uh, uh, the interaction between machine, the term machine, and learning, those two together make a topic. Uh, so the kind of compute graph that you get are horrible. And it means that things like out-of-core operations, which is basically what we're doing when we're chunking data, are not efficient. There's no data locality. Uh, so one approach is to do algorithm development, which is what I do, so I'm happy. And the idea being that you use uh, online algorithms. So it's basically you don't use the same algorithm. You use an algorithm that works on a stream and then you start chunking the data in the algorithm. So uh, if you've heard of deep learning, then the number one algorithm that's used in deep learning is stochastic gradient descent, and that's how it works. That's how people can apply deep learning, which is extremely computationally expensive, to huge data sets. So back to data science. Uh, uh, so we, I've shown you how we can go from a matrix of term document to a factorization. And there's magic here, right? So there's an algorithm. I did not discuss how it works. We just imported it from scikit-learn. Uh, what, what the scikit-learn devs do is that they take horrible papers full of math expressions, and drinking a lot of coffee, they turn it into this code. Uh, it's actually really hard, by the way. Uh, people have been asking me yesterday, so why do we still use code that's written 40 years ago or 20 years ago in Fortran, because writing stable numerical code is extremely hard, and no better code has been written so far. So the reason that we, scikit-learn and PyData, have been able to do this is thanks to the high-level syntax of Python and everything I've presented here. So the reason all this is important is because it reduces our cognitive load and allows us to do math. All right, let's talk a bit about something else than numerics. And let's talk about the future and about what's going to make PyData great again, maybe. So I think that we've been seeing recently that data flow and computation flow are crucial. So you can have you know, the simple data parallel problems. You can have the messy compute graphs. You can have you know, online algorithms. And so data flow engines are actually popping up everywhere. So for instance, maybe you've heard of DOSC. So DOSC is a pure Python static graph compiler, so it will represent a set of calls, of function calls on data as a graph, and compile it, uh, and then use a dynamic scheduler on this to do parallel and distributed computing, okay? So it's really nice, except it's basically static, which means I can't add things to my graph, okay? Another uh, uh, tool that people use in deep learning is Theano, and you, people pr probably don't realize, but it has expression analysis in pure Python, builds a graph of operations, and optimizes this. TensorFlow is a C++, I believe, library developed by Google to do deep learning, and it also builds a graph of operations. So graphs of operations are there in many, uh, many different libraries. Uh, below the hood. I believe that Python should really shine here because it's reflective, we can do some form of meter programming, and because of the recent async developments, because I think the future is for parallel and distributed computing. So as Nathaniel Smith, who is an NumPy developer, said, Python is the best numerical language out there because it's not a numerical language. And I believe this is extremely true. 
Now, we have a bit of a problem here is that the API is really challenging because we're doing algorithm design and we can't really do what, what you guys have been doing in something like Django where there's basically an inversion of control uh, and, and you're no longer writing imperative code as you would do your buying into a framework. And I don't believe that we can write really complex algorithms like this. There's just too much cognitive uh, overload. But it's just an API design. We'll, we'll solve it. So in terms of ingredients for uh, future data flows, I think distributed computation and runtime analysis are really important things. And for this, I think reflexivity is central. It's really useful for debug, by the way. If, if, if I'm not in Python, the number one thing I miss is, is the ability to debug. And I can debug in a, in a high-level way, which means I can debug things like numerical instability in my algorithm. And that's really hard to do. You know, you've got something that blows up somewhere in terms of numerical precision. Uh, Python is fantastic to debug this. I can do interactive work, which is how most data scientists work. This will enable us, this already enables us and will enable us more code analysis which is going to be really important for being efficient. And it gives us persistence, which is extremely important for parallel computing. Because when you're doing parallel and distributed computing, you need to move data, well, you need to move objects around between different computers, and you need to move code. And for this, you need reflexivity. So I realized that, so we've been relying on, on Pickle. Distributed computing has been relying hugely on, on Pickle. Uh, and the idea is that it uses it to distribute the code and the data between the, the different uh, uh, workers. But we can also use it to serialize intermediate results. Okay? So that's one way of, of doing computation on data where uh, all the intermediate results might not fit in, in RAM. It can be made very easily with Python. And another thing that, that we do is that we actually use Pickle to get a deep hash in the sense of a, a cryptographic hash uh, of any data structure. So that's really nice because it allows you to see if things have changed or not. So to avoid recomputation. Now the problem is that Pickle is actually very limited, the way it's implemented in the core, uh, the core library. For instance, there's no uh, uh, support for lambdas. And these things are not fundamental limitations. Uh, there are trade-offs, basically. And so there are variants of Pickle, like Dill or Cloud Pickle. And I must say that I, I'd really like one of those two, or maybe IDs from one of those two, to go in the standard library, because it's actually limiting hugely parallel computing not to be able to pickle everything. So I realize we're never going to be able to pickle absolutely everything. And I also realized that I can write code that always pickle. That's what I do. But when I give this to a um, not very advanced user, he will at some point write the code that doesn't pickle. So for me, by the way, this is more important than the gil. That may be surprising, but when you, you get to know distributed computing well, these things are a problem. Data exchange, basically. Uh, now, we have this, this small library that we call joblib that allows us to do ingredients for data flow computing. And one thing it does is a very simple parallel uh, computing syntax, which is basically a, a, a syntactic sugar for parallel for loops. And behind the hood, it uses threading or multiprocessing or just about any backend you can plug in. You can plug in your own backend in there. Uh, it does uh, fast persistence, so it's basically a subclass of pickle that does clever things for NumPy arrays. And it gives primitives for out-of-core uh, 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 computation. The reason I'm pointing this out is it's actually very non-invasive syntax and paradigms. Uh, so this, with a library like Joblib, we can write algorithms. And it's actually used uh, in, inside scikit-learn, even though you may, you may not know it. Uh, it's fast. It's been designed to be fast on NumPy arrays. And it's getting more and more uh, an extendable backend system. So uh, I'm looking forward to a world where we can use things like Celery uh, to uh, basically distribute computation uh, from scikit-learn in more of a, a web development environment. I don't know if it's a good or a bad idea, but I'd like to try it. So I think the Python VM is great. It's awesome. And one of the reasons it's great, it's because it's simple, which is what a lot of people have been criticizing. So for instance, the Java world, 
tells us that they have software transactional memory, and it's really cool. It would be nice for Python, but I personally really need to use foreign memory. I need it. And interestingly, Java has gained recently uh, jmalloc to allocate basically foreign memory. We'd like better garbage collection. We really would like. But just about every C extension relies on reference counting. And the reason is it's actually very easy to manipulate the reference counting if you're not sitting in the VM, right? So basically, the Python VM is something that I can manipulate without being inside it, which means that it's really great to connect to compiled languages. And I'm talking to people in the conference. Many people actually use this. Many people use libraries that have been developed in another language through Python. And I'd like to, to draw a bit of attention to uh, Cython. Who knows Cython? Good. Who uses Cython? Good. It really gives us the best of C and Python. You can add types for speed. And they've done things so right that when you add, when you type a NumPy array, it basically becomes a float star. So a, a, a float array in C. So super fast. But you can also use it to bind external libraries. And it's surprisingly easy. The good thing is suddenly you're working with C libraries. You're, you're working with C-like code without any malloc free or pointer arithmetics, which is, for me, the number one problem of these languages. So I see this as an adaptation layer between the Python VM and C, and it's really a fantastic tool. By the way, I think everybody should be writing C extensions using Cython because it's an abstraction over the C Python, library, uh, the C Python um, uh, API. So for instance, you can write code that's very readable, and that compiles with Python 3 and Python uh, 2, even though there's been a lot of changes in the C Python API. So it's also good, I believe it's also good for the NumPy core developers because uh, they'd like to change things in the C Python uh, uh, API. And if everybody writes Cython, they will be able to, because Cython will do the, the impedance matching. OK, so we scientists can work with web developers, and we really actually get to love each other, I believe. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm really serious here. I actually really enjoy people who are not doing science in the Python community. They're, first, they teach me thing, things. Second, they make fantastic tools that I can use. And so I'd like our tools to be useful for us. And I'd like to point out that scikit-learn is actually really easy machine learning. It's really a very simple syntax. Basically, you import an object, and it's a magic object that will do classification, so recognition of things. You instantiate it, and then you give it data. So it's basically matrices, right? We only do matrices. And so you have to figure out how you convert your own data to matrices. And then you call fit, and then you call predict. OK? So people, one of the successes of scikit-learn is, is this encapsulation. People have really loved the fact that the classifier is a semi-black box, so they can use it without fully understanding it. Uh, so that's another thing that Python has given us, is uh, object-oriented in a really, really cool model that allows uh, uh, to do object-oriented programming without, uh, say, crazy, um, uh, uh, crazy class diagrams. Uh, and another thing that we've uh, used hugely is uh, what people have called doc documentation-driven development. So there was a talk about this. Uh, so to try to make this API as simple as possible. What I'm trying to get at here is that we're trying to give you a high-level, simple API to reduce your cognitive load, just like Python and NumPy reduces our cognitive load when we're implementing these algorithms. So we all do very different things here, and we can all benefit from each other. But we can do this only if we're really careful to reduce each other's cognitive load on what the other does not understand. I think that's extremely important. So it's important to be didactic outside of one's own community. And actually, Python is really good at this. The Django uh, documentation is known as being really excellent. 
Python worries about syntax being beautiful. Uh, so to do this, we need to do things like avoiding jargon. So machine learning is really bad. It's full of jargon. We in scikit-learn try not to have too much. We need to prioritize information. And so for instance, students that are applied math students and learn about numerics, I hate to tell you they don't care about Unicode. Even the French ones that have umlauts on their first name. Uh, one recommendation I have for people that, that, that do API design is build your documentation upon very simple examples and examples that run. So one thing that we do is that we have this thing that's called Sphinx Gallery that basically uses Sphinx, Sphinx is awesome, to build our documentation and running all the examples. So it means that the examples must run, they must run fast. It means they must be small enough to run. And so I think that has helped a lot both the documentation, but also the API design of scikit-learn. All right, to wrap up, I think it's, be it's because of the interaction between people like scientists and people who are not scientists, whether they're web developers or DevOps or anything. Have I been censored? <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Um, what was I saying? Well, anyhow, the Python language in its VM is the perfect tool to, to manipulate low-level concepts, whether you know, they're arrays or actually you can manipulate things like, like trees in C with high-level wording. And I personally think, it's a personal opinion, but this has been key to the recent success of Python. Python has been growing hugely, and when you look at how people are using it, at some point, they're plugging to something low-level very often. Dynamism and reflexivity are crucial because it enables metaprogramming and debugging. But we also find that we need for compilation, for speed. So then there's this, this tension between dynamism and compilation. And I have the feeling it's everywhere. It's also in web development with, say, compiling SQL queries. Uh, and I'm extremely excited about the PEPs that Victor Stinner is pushing forwards, like um, guards uh, on internal structures to allow uh, checking uh, at runtime for modifications. So that will allow us any kind of hacks that we do on the code to be uh, uh, invalidated uh, if the environment changes, uh, or the PEP for functional specialization. Finally, I think that PyData has gained and will gain hugely from a database world and the concurrency that are developed a lot in the world and DevOps uh, world. But I think it can also give back uh, things like knowledge engineering and AI, which are really you know, growing hugely. And just in case you haven't noticed, uh, data science is disrupting just about every job that that you're doing. So it's cool that there is data science in Python. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail. Um, yeah, great keynote, great insights, and a uh, different, little different world. So, questions? Raise your hand. Mike. So, give the mic to Mike. <laughs> Thanks. Very interesting keynote. Uh, one thing I just, it's not a question, just a statement. Uh, the scientific world was a very early adapter of Python 3. I think they were just several years ago. The most of the scientific stack was in Python 3, which is a great thing. I actually can use pretty much any uh, good scientific package in Python 3. That's something I want to add. Yeah. And I agree. And the, the biggest cost of uh, Python 3 first was the change of the uh, C Python API. And so actually, people still in niche applications have code that doesn't run on Python 3 because of the C Python API, but all the main libraries by vast margin 
run on three, and everything I do runs on three and two. Question? Okay, uh, you probably get that a lot, but I will ask anyways. Have you heard about PyPy? <laughs> I was actually trolling a bit in my talk. Yeah, I know a lot about PyPy. Uh, so uh, to give a bit of background, my, my brother uh, studied uh, uh, language theory, so we've had crazy discussions all the time. Uh, so yeah, I know a lot about these things. Uh, and part of the things I wanted to talk in my talk was the fact that it's not only about type checking. NumPy is not only about type checking, it's about the memory model. Uh, and I think, by the way, PyPy has progressed hugely in this sense, which is it is no longer trying to say, I'm going to control the memory for everything, uh, which historically was a big roadblock for us. I mean, we, I could not believe that PyPy would be useful for scientific computing because for a long time I heard that the end goal of PyPy were things like a software transactional memory, which is really cool, by the way, but will cost us things a lot in our world. And the other thing is we're not going to get rid of the compiled code because there is so much history in making those algorithms really good, and it's extremely hard. But I do believe that what, what the PyPy world is, is doing, which is a lot of analysis on the code, is extremely, extremely useful. That, that I absolutely believe. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Oh, really in the back, okay. Okay, sorry, Daria is faster. I'm sorry, but yeah, go ahead. You keep, you keep referring to our world, your Python world. Is the division that clear? Uh, not for me, not for me at all. Uh, I've got personal friends in all the communities. Uh, I use all kinds of different tools, but I'm afraid there is a division. Uh, and I'd like to think that it's fueled by, by different trade-offs. Uh, and I'd like to fight it, by the way. I don't want it, I don't think it's useful. But when, when you hear you know, things like Conda, which is so a packager for Python and other things. And the reason it was created was basically because, and the way I think of it is the reason it was created was because the, the, the scientific crowd was unable to explain the struggles it was having with the um, uh, packaging tools in Python and just went on and did their own stuff. Now the good thing is that some people were, some people actually came back and, and worked and now PIP, I believe, should be able to work fine. But that's one example of the division. And I think it exists and I think we need to fight it because our value, that's something I really believe in, our value is the fact that we're diverse and we're able to work together. A quick question. Um, how, do you see, do you, how do you see the scenario in five, ten years, com, com, Python comparing to other languages like R or the old Wolfram or things, new things? So R or, or? Wolfram language. So you're, you're talking in, in the scientific Python, in the scientific world? Yeah. All right, I'm going to be extremely opinionated. I think R will die. So, <laughs> well, to give you background, when we started Scikit-Learn, what, almost seven years ago, everybody would walk up to us and say, you guys are crazy. Everybody does R or eh, machine learning. Everybody does MATLAB. Okay, you know, seven years down the line, nobody is mentioning this. So, by the way, R is awesome, not as a language. It's a horrible language. But in terms of libraries, as I told you, you know, uh, numerical algorithms are really hard. Well, R has a crazy amount of them. And for me, a statistician, R is the reference. But the value of data analysis is not only in numerics, it's in combining things. And I think we have an edge here. So uh, uh, MATLAB, yeah, I think we're eating MATLAB slowly. And they're fighting back. I'm getting emails on a monthly basis. Get a training to come to MathWork to see how we're cooler than Python. Uh, uh, but, but the fact that we're going up, whereas they're pouring money to fight us, is telling me something. 
Maybe it's going to take a bit of time, but in the scientific world, I mean, in a, a, the strong container would be Julia. Uh, Julia is a type language uh, that is able to do fantastic type inference and compile to extremely fast uh, code. Actually, it uses an LLVM. Uh, I really don't like it. I mean, it's a fantastic language. It's awesome, fantastic language design. I really don't like it because it's a numerical language. And they don't think of it that way. But it's the, the whole community is a numerical community. And I'm worried that it's going to paint itself in a corner. Yeah. Gil, uh, thanks for the fantastic talk and the fantastic library. Scikit-learn is only one of the libraries in the Scikit family. There is also Scikit-image and Scikit-bio. What is your relationship with the Scikit family? So that's very historical. We used to have, that's like 2008, there used to be a Scikits with an S uh, namespace package. Uh, if you guys remember namespace packages, they're one of my nightmares uh, uh, in SciPy. Uh, and that's how we all started. And then we took it out of SciPy because SciPy was getting too big. Uh, and then we got rid of the, the namespace package that used to be called scikits.learn, and we turned it into scikit-learn, uh, and it means scientific kit. Uh, it's very historical. But uh, what's our relationship? I guess we're friends. We're good friends. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, last question. Oh, yeah. Fabio. Oh, Fabio. Yeah. Um, one, it's sort of question and to point out uh, uh, one specific thing about Conda that um, is beyond Python and beyond PIP is where it comes to struggle. Uh, people come to struggle with non-Python specific stuff. So if you want a, a database or a specific, uh, you want to install a stack with Node.js and, and, and Python, you can, you can actually do that. So it actually sits on top of Python, not in, it's more like the app to get than, than pip. Um, so in this case, I'm not, I'm not really sure Python should have uh, something in the standard library that actually does that. What, what's your opinion on that? Oh, so I completely agree. So, so the comment is Conda is more than Python, basically. Uh, and I know this, by the way, but historically it's not been marketed like this. I mean, I've heard way too much uh, don't use pip, use conda, which is, I mean, I hear this in my lab, by the way, and I fight it. Uh, and the other thing is, I haven't seen much work go from conda to, I'm not even talking about contributing back to pip, but I'm talking about explaining what was being learned. And I think it's extremely important. I would really like, I would like conda forge. I'm, I'm going to say bold statement, but I would like conda forge for, for Python to either die or to push automatically to PyPy. Pushing automatically to PyPy would be awesome, but we need one place where we can tell everybody, go and get your stuff, and we need this place to be good, and we need to work together. Uh, and in a sense, Kana has achieved this because and one thing it has created is it's created an, an, maybe an anxiety, or at least it's shown that you can do things better. Uh, but you need to go all the way back and get, get you know, back in the wider Python ecosystem, uh, the improvements, because it's all going to benefit us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we have, have one more thing to announce, so please don't run away after you've given a fantastic, enthusiastic applause for Gail's keynote. Thank you very much, Gail.